So this is the fourth part of introduction to human factors. And I know you're going to cry about it when I tell you. Let's see if I can make this work. I know you're going to cry about it when I tell you, but today's the last day of human factors. In fact, I don't even think we'll spend the entire day doing human factors. I know you're disappointed because we're going to have that whole second half of the chapter on physiology, but don't worry, we will cover that physiology later in the semester. In the meantime, I want to watch just about three minutes out of this five-minute video on doing a pre-flight on a Cessna 172, which is the same model of airplane that you're flying uh, X-plane in. So I'm not going to go into all these things, but this is usually this is what it kind of looks like, although you don't usually wear a red vest. I don't know why he's wearing a red vest, because there's not that many cars out there to run over you. Is that okay? Is that too dark? I'll, if, well, I'll turn on one of the lights. So you're checking things inside the airplane. You're checking things outside of the airplane. You're turning on the electrical master switch, seeing if the lights work. You're uh, looking at the gas gauges. And he just, he stands on the side of the airplane there for a long time. Let's see. Yeah, you look up at the sky. Of course, you look up at the sky. So now he's looking at the tail of the airplane. There's the elevator, and there's the trim tab, and there's the rudder. He's making sure it all works, or at least it's not, uh, it's, nothing seems to be broken. There's the trim tab. And you're looking at the flaps, you're looking at the antennas, you're looking at the tires, you're looking at the brakes, you're wiggling stuff. After a while, you learn what all those things are, and you know how much they ought to wiggle and how much they ought not to wiggle. You're looking for things that commonly break, and you're looking at those a little bit more, uh, a little more carefully. Hopefully in a second here, it's, so there he's checking the tire. Hopefully he'll check the oil next. So there's the oil. He's actually going to pull the stick out. It's like a dipstick on a car. And uh, the, this airplane holds eight quarts. You've got to have at least six. And he's, he's actually pulling a no, uh, lever, and it's draining fuel out of the bottom of the airplane. And that's in case there's water. Water is heavier than gasoline, so the water goes to the bottom. There he's looking in the intakes, seeing if there's any birds stuck in there. He's checking the propeller, the spinner, the exhaust, looking at the nose tire, a bunch of stuff like that. So he's very happy. The airplane he thinks is going to work just fine. So what we're going to do today is after the lecture is over, I think we'll have 10 or 15 minutes left in class. We're going to leave everything in the classroom, and we're going to go out into the lab, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to introduce you to airplane parts, what, what they're called, what they do, what, a little bit of the pre-flight, a little bit what you're looking for when you're inspecting an airplane. So... We're in part four of human factors, O1C, intro to human factors, part four. Situational awareness. I had mentioned this two, three, four lecture days ago. Situational awareness, the definition is can you tell, you have accurate perception of the operational and the environmental factors that might screw with you. And so environmental factors are like weather, your passengers hollering at you, how high in altitude you are, what the mountains are, are you over the ocean? Uh, the in operational ones are, did I put enough gas on board the airplane? Do I know where I am? Uh, I'm burning fuel as fast as I think it normally would. What happens in a car when you're driving along and it runs out of gas? Most of the time, what happens? 99% of the time. It stops moving, but can you pull off to the side of the road pretty easy? How often do you drive, or have you seen someone drive where there wasn't a place to pull off? It's not zero. It's not never. What if on a, there are on some highways that don't have shoulders, but most of the freeways, at least in California and Arizona where I drive a lot, there's usually a shoulder. Places I think of are our bridges, sometimes don't have a shoulder. Uh, if you're, I live in Squaw Valley, so I drive up Highway 180 for about 10 minutes, 
and there's no shoulder on most of that road, and there's only a turn off like every quarter to a half of a mile. So there are some places where if the engine stopped running, you couldn't pull over. But, but what would happen if I couldn't pull over? I'd be stopped in the middle of the road. I'd turn on my red flashers and hope nobody comes around the corner at 70 miles an hour and hits me. So if I'm smart, I'm going to get out of the car and walk 20 or 30 feet away. <laughs> so if somebody accidentally hits the car, they don't push it into me. But most of the time, it's not that big of a deal. So you don't. How much, so really, what are the bad things that happen to you when you are not aware of how much fuel is on board the airplane, on the on the you know, on board the car? Really, really bad things don't happen because you ran out of gas, and it happens very infrequently. How many times do you drive a car and you're worried about running out of gas? Not very often. Most of the time, you go flying, go driving, and you drive three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times before you have to put fuel on board. In airplanes, it's very common to put fuel on board almost every time you go flying. So we think about it a lot differently when we're pilots. So the definition of situational awareness is the accurate perception. That is, am I actually getting data into my brain that's, at, that's true of all the th environmental issues and all, and I correction, environmental issues like weather in the mountains and the runway and operational issues, am I going to run out of gas, that might affect safety. Because if you're not paying attention and you don't have an accurate perception or you don't know it at all, then things might happen without you planning. And that, that, that in a car, the consequences of things happening without you planning are pretty small. Let's say you decide you're going to drive up to the Kings Canyon Sequoia National Park, and it's in October. If you drive halfway up the hill and they say chain fired and you don't have chains, what's the worst thing that happened? You turn around go back down the hill and you go to In-N-Out Burger in Fresno. That, this is not the most terrible. Maybe you don't go to In-N-Out Burger. they got these lettuce wraps. You ask for protein. I'll do it in lettuce instead of, instead of buns, so it's low carb. So that means I can eat them and not get as fat as I would otherwise. In any case, we'll talk about, we'll talk about low carbohydrate uh, nutritional plans outside of class if you want to. But uh, in cars, when you don't know what's going to happen in front of you or, or 5 or 10 or 20 or 30 minutes ahead of you, it's not that big of a deal. In airplanes, it's a big deal. So this second line here is pilots need to be able to assess the current and the future. This is really important. Not only do you have to understand what's going on right now, but you have to understand what's going to happen next and happen after that and happen after that. What's going to happen in 5 minutes, 15 minutes, a half an hour or an hour? What if you do one of those crate, you do a ferry in an airplane, let's say you can actually take a Cessna 172, take all the seats out but the pilot seats, and they put in 50 or 60 gallons of gasoline in the back. Johnny. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Why is that junk in? Why is that toolbar there? There it is. Okay. Let's say you load up your Cessna 172. It's mostly fuel. You take off out of Monterey, California, and you're going to Hilo, Hawaii, and it's 2,400 miles. And your airplane goes 100 nautical miles an hour. It's going to take you 24 hours. And you plan, and you have 25 hours of gas. You take off, and you're halfway there, and you start looking at the wind, and you realize the wind is stronger than you thought, and it's a headwind. Now you start calculating it, and you realize you're not going to land at 24 hours. You're going to land at 24 and a half hours. Now you only have a half an hour of extra gasoline. You keep going and the wind gets more than predicted even more, and now it says you're going to land at 24 hours and 45 minutes. And you still have seven hours to go. You're only two-thirds of the way there. Yeah, that's, that's when the, the seat cushion starts to deform. So think about that for a minute. The seat, seat cushion starts to deform because of pucker factor. Does that help give you a clue? You're going to start, things are, your muscles are going to contract in your body that normally don't stay contracted all the time. Um, so you, thinking far ahead, what, you, what you, one would have hoped you had done was looked at the forecast weather 24 hours in advance and said, okay, here's how bad the, I think the wind is going to be. Maybe I'm going to take an extra hour of fuel, and if it takes 24 hours, not take off with 25 hours, but maybe I'm going to take an extra 10 gallons and take off with 26 hours of fuel. And in that case, you were, you were looking way ahead at what might happen. It's not just what you know is going to happen, but it's also what you think might happen and what can you do about it. Of course, the problem there is, will the airplane take off with that 10 more gallons of gas? Because that gasoline weighs 6 pounds a gallon, so that's 60 more pounds. Will it get off the ground and climb? 
taken off out of Monterey Airport. Has anybody ever flown to Monterey Airport? Am I saying that correctly? Anybody ever been to Monterey? Is there a Monterey, Mexico? Okay, and there's a Monterey. I don't know how you say California in Spanish. How do you say California in Spanish? California? Everybody calls it California? All right, okay. All right, so there's all kinds of data or information that you can get either before the flight or during the flight. And this is just a minor list here. You can get information about the terrain, the weather, the traffic, that's their airplanes, air traffic control, information about the airplane you're flying, the airspace you're going to fly around in, what kind of navigation equipment do you have, what kind of navigation equipment is on the ground. So there's a lot of planning you have to make and go, hmm, if this breaks, am I still going to be happy? If that doesn't work, am I still going to be happy? If I get there and it's not the way I thought it was going to be, am I still going to be happy? Because I'm telling you, if you're an hour away from Hilo, Hawaii, and you've only got 15 minutes more of fuel, the worst case scenario is not, you're not, oh darn, I have to go eat at In-N-Out Burger. It's going to be, I'm going to ditch in the water inside of the island of Hilo, and the airplane will be totaled. But at least I'll get to use my life raft and my, and my, uh, my uh, what do you call that thing, my life preserver. So one of the best ways to maintain situational awareness, this last line, SA is an abbreviation for situational awareness, briefings. So what you're going to find is when you're flying with another pilot, you pretty much always brief whoever's going to do the takeoff. You brief to the other pilot, hey, this is what we're going to do in takeoff. We're going to go down the end of the runway with the throttle full forward. I'm going to stay on the center line of the runway at 60 knots. I'm going to rotate. Then I'm going to climb at 60 knots. And then I'm going to climb at 80 knots. If the engine fails before we get off the ground, I'm going to pull the throttle back to idle and apply brakes and stop because we've got a long enough runway. If the engine quits by the, somewhere between getting off the ground and 1,000 feet, then I'm just going to land mostly straight ahead, and I know what the terrain is. At Reedley Airport, it's an orange field, an orange grove. I'm going to land in the orange groves. <laughs> There's worse places to land than orange groves. You know, and if it's above 1,000 feet, then I'll probably be able to turn around and come back to the airport. And you brief that. So if something, does, if the engine, because that's usually the worst thing that can happen on a takeoff, is for the, or right after you take off during the climb out, is for the engine to quit. If you brief what you're going to do, you've made yourself aware of the possibilities that might exist, and you've made yourself aware of the things that you're going to do. So there's all, there are, for instance, everybody, anybody, if you've ever been on an airline, you notice the flight attendants or a computer or it gives you a briefing. They tell you about your seat belts and oxygen and flotation devices and stuff like that. That's keeping passengers aware. How many people have ever, even once, read the little in-flight card that has all the stuff on it for the airplane? I read that thing all often, often. After a while, you read it, and it's pretty much the same as the last one. The only really difference is where are the where are the life rafts, which are almost always in the overhead compartment somewhere, but the flight attendants are going to get those. And really, it's where is the nearest exit. Everybody's going to try to run to the front of the airplane, and they're going to forget about the ones in the back. So I'm going to wait till the crowd goes past me and then go to the back, if I'm in the back of the airplane, that is. Or I try to sit in the emergency seat over the wing so I get to open the door and get out first. Of course, I'll be the hero and turn around and help everybody out, but only after I'm out of the airplane. All right, so briefings, and this is normally what's occur when you're flying in an aircraft and it's a two-person cockpit. That is, you have a captain and a co-pilot or a pilot and a co-pilot. You pretty much always, when you're coming into land, whoever's going to do the flying briefs the other pilot. Even if you're the aircraft commander, you're going to brief the co-pilot. Okay, we're going to fly this landing system, and here's the frequency, here's the magnetic heading we're going to fly, we're going to descend at this point, you cover the five or ten major things you're going to do, and you say, if we can't see the runway because the weather's really bad, we're going to execute a missed approach, if we have to execute that missed approach, we're going to climb, go to 5,000 feet, turn right, blah, 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 so it's in you and the other pilot's mind exactly what you're going to do if you land and what you're going to do if you can't land. So that really improves situational awareness because now it, it, it changes your focus to exactly what you need to know for the next five or ten minutes. All right. Sea fit, controlled flight into terrain. So this slide is about being aware of controlled flight into terrain. I hate CFIT. 
In the aviation world, this gets abbreviated to an acronym called CFIT, Controlled Flight into Terrain. This would be an awesome test question on the final exam. CFIT is an abbreviation for what four words? And you would write down Controlled Flight into Terrain. This is one of the leading killers of people on board air, uh, airplanes, in particular non-airlines. Because the airlines, I won't get into all the details, but they stay away from the terrain really, really well. It's people in little tiny airplanes, and the weather's bad, and they're trying to stay out of the clouds, and oops, pow, they forget the fact that there's a mountain right there. You know it's bad when you're flying along, and you can start to see a hole in the cloud, and you see a goat. Because what's the goat standing on? A mountain, and you probably are so close you're going to hit it. I think there's a Far Side cartoon where they say, what's a goat doing up here? Okay, so the definition of controlled flight into terrain is where the airplane has flown into the ground and the pilot doesn't know that they're coming close to the ground. Because if the pilot knew, they would pull up, would do something and turn around. They would fly in the opposite direction or climb. So controlled flight into terrain is not out of control. You hit the ground. It's when you're in control of the airplane and you don't know the ground is there because you're screwing up really bad. I hate that. So how do you prevent control flight into terrain, see fit? Well, first of all, whatever your flight is, you need to make a plan on how you're not going to hit the mountains or the river or the ocean or the hills or the towers. You know the radio tower. You know there's a set of four radio towers just north of Orange Cove? And they're like 400 feet tall. There's four of them. they got lights on them and everything. Yeah, you could hit those if you weren't paying attention. I got this app in an iPad. One of these days this semester, I'll bring it in. I'll show you. And if you're flying down that low, it actually shows it in red and effectively lets you know, hey, there's something out there you're going you're gonna to run into if you don't do something. So that's actually a very nice feature. So you want to make your flight plan. You want to plan your flight so that you don't hit the mountains. You want to use charts so that you can look at the chart and see where the terrain is. For instance, in 1980, right after I got my flight instructor certificate, uh, some people wanted to fly to Las Vegas. So I flew an airplane, a 182. It's four seats, but it goes about 140 miles an hour. And they, went to, they wanted to go see the Holmes Ali fight. It was Muhammad Ali's last fight. He lost it in 90 seconds or something like that. My passengers were not very happy because they paid a lot of money to see a fight that only lasted 90 seconds. But the best way to do it is not fly over mountains that are too high. It's go down about to Visalia and then turn left and go pretty much due east towards Las Vegas. And the mountains are two or 3,000 feet below you. When you come back, you need to do the same thing. But when we came back, it was dark. How many lights are lit up in the middle of the Sierra Nevada mountain range? Pretty much none. Pretty much none. And this is before GPS. I'm flying a heading. Okay, well, that's the heading. The forecast wind. I calculated how much to turn into the wind. And we're flying along, and I can't see mountains for squat. And I'm at 12,500 feet, and I know there's mountains down there at 9, 9 10,000 feet. Woo-hoo-hoo. I, I had a plan. And I, could, I figured out I could be off 30 miles either way and not have any trouble because I, that's why you got to go down to Visalia. Is because Mount Whitney is at 14,500 feet. If you, in fact, go from Reedley and go to Dinuba and you're exactly halfway there, that's Mount Whitney. And Alex, would you not use your cell phone during class, please? Thank you. So in addition to using charts, you want to monitor the terrain if there's any way to do that. Now, on that flight I was talking about, you can't really monitor the terrain back then because there was no lights on the terrain, and I didn't have GPS, so I couldn't swear exactly any given moment. This is exactly where I was. But now with GPS, you know exactly, you can know exactly where you are all the time because you're communicating with satellites that are above you. The mountains don't get in the way for navigation signals. So now you can monitor the terrain really, really, really easy. And then, of course, this is the one that people forget about, is that you've got to understand how well does the airplane climb. For instance, the higher you go in altitude, the thinner the air is. So when the engine pulls in air, it doesn't pull in as much oxygen, so it can't burn as much gasoline. Well, if the engine can't burn as much gasoline, it can't develop as much horsepower. So at some point, your little airplane is going to climb, and it's going to climb slower and slower. And at some point, you're going to be holding the nose up, but it won't climb anymore. You're going to be sitting there at 12,000 feet. Well, what if the mountain's at 14,000 feet? 
So if you're going to go fly anywhere different, like if you take flying lessons here in the central San Joaquin Valley, you can get your entire private pilot certificate and never leave the central San Joaquin Valley. You can fly down to Bakersfield, up to Stockton or Sacramento, over to Mendota. That is a rockin' town. Has anybody ever been to Mendota? There's almost 2,000 people in that city. Almost. Man, you go there on a Friday and Saturday night, and it's just like, you know, if you walk to downtown, which is about a half a mile away from the airport, there's almost always at least someone else downtown on a sidewalk at the same time. Actually, I've never been to Mendota. Minkler, yeah, but there's no airport in Minkler. There's no airport in Minkler. You, oh, you could go to Fireball. In any case, you can stay inside the San Joaquin Valley where it's flat like a pancake, and the highest ground around here is around 400 feet. Really, all you got to worry about is radio towers. But you might decide, I want to go to Vegas, or I want to go to Monterey. i got to fly over the hills. There's like two, 3,000-foot mountains. Woohoo! I might have to climb to five or 6,000 feet. So you want to make sure your airplane can perform, and can it get off the ground? The highest airport in the United States is Leadville in uh, Colorado, and it's at about 10,000 feet. The little airplanes you take flying lessons in on a hot day in the summer, they won't climb at 10,000 feet. If you push them off the runway and it's actually got a mountain, that airplane would descend even at full power because it can't maintain altitude. That's not really a good plan. Oh, well, when I get off the edge, I'll just glide. That's not a good idea. It's not The airplane won't climb at 10,000 feet. So that might be a terrible airplane to go in the summertime. But here's what's interesting. When the weather is cold, when the air is cold, the molecules don't bounce around as much, so the air contracts, so it's more compressed. Or maybe instead of pressure, it's molecules per cubic foot. So when the engine pulls that air in, not because it's cold, but cold makes it more dense, it pulls in a lot of oxygen, it can burn a lot of fuel, and the engine will produce more horsepower. So although you might be at 10,000 feet above sea level, the air density may be only fly takeoff 6,000 feet. So if you want to go to Leadville, I recommend you wait until December or January and then take off in the morning when it's like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, I'm only going to say one thing or to have you write down one thing about automation management. The more expensive the airplane you fly, the more things that it does for you. Like, for instance, we'll take a brand new airliner by Airbus or Boeing. The autopilot, once you program it, you don't have to do much of anything unless air traffic control calls you up and tells you to turn left or turn right and fly a different way. It just flies the route that you input. It stays at the altitude you wanted. The flight attendants bring you first class food. You know, if you're first class or the pilots, you get cloth napkins, stainless steel. I a bit of American Airlines a while back. And I had never, I've never, even since then, I've never been in first class. I didn't know what it was like. But I was used to getting the plastic utensils and lousy food. But the pilots, they get first class food. They just sat there, and they, about every 15 or 20 minutes, they'd have to talk to air traffic control. Usually one person would be reading a magazine, trying to stay awake, and the other one, you know, they, about every five minutes they'd look up and go, hmm, 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 hmm. yeah, okay, everything's good. And the other person's actually monitoring the airplane all the time, just going, hmm, 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 the whole time. Yeah, you're grinning. Yeah, just pretend you were a bus driver, but there was a locked door between you and the passengers, and there was a bus attendant back there to feed them and tell them where the bathroom was so they could never come bother you. And you're driving the bus, and there's a magnetic strip down the middle of the road, and the bus will follow that magnetic strip, and there's no stop signs and no stop lights. You're just on a freeway. Yeah, you just kind of it's Oh, wait, that's like being a subway driver. Yeah, being an airline pilot is the same as being a subway car driver. There's a couple other differences. In any case, I, since you don't have much of a background, you know, how many people in here have ever operated an autopilot? Okay. So some autopilots, it'll just keep the wings level. 
and it won't let you, you get enough fun, and it will keep you at the same altitude. You won't climb and descend. Then there's another one that will follow a certain route on the ground. Then there's another one that when you're supposed to, it'll climb or descend you. Then there's another one you add to it, and it'll run the engines for you. It's awesome. You just kind of go like, yeah, I want some apple pie. So you hit the flight attendant button. Do we got any apple pie back there? And they go, yeah, this is first class food. We have apple pie. I don't know. Has anybody ever flown first class? Can you get apple pie on demand out of first class? I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's boysenberry pie that day. I'm just thinking that's what I would order if I was an airline pie and I could choose. What would I have the flight attendants bring me? I'd like me some pie. All right. So you don't have to write this down, but the rest of this chapter on uh, human factors is aviation physiology. Up to now, we've talked about what's going on in your head. Aviation physiology is what's going on in your body, about gases that expand and contract, and how well can you see at night, and how do you, can you get dizzy, and make your plan, you know, what makes your toes swell up, you know. Well, actually, when you fly, I'm trying to think. I can't think of a circumstance in flying that would make your toes swell up. Not unless you went into outer space, and I, we're not going to get into outer space. So don't worry. I know you're thinking, oh, I'm, I really missed that chapter on physiology, that second half. We're going to get to it then. So let's pull out the syllabus. It says 101 on the top. It's got this schedule out here. It says 101 at the top. It says 101 at the top. If you lost yours completely, I, I might have one in my office. See me at break. And on the back page, let's see. On the back page... On November 28, it says aviation physiology on the back of the front. It's a front piece of paper, but it's printed on the back side. It's page 2. It's got a little 2 at the bottom. It's got a little 2 at the bottom. On November the 28th, it says aviation physiology. Off to the right there, you can put in the page. You can put in pages. Uh, just write in second half of chapter 1. Just write in second half of chapter 1. Don't worry. I will remind you to read that. We'll see if we can squeeze it in. We've been playing paperwork so much that uh, we're noticeably behind schedule, and we have to catch up. Because according to the schedule, today is the 29th, and we should have done airplanes yesterday. So that means we're at least two days behind, which is not the end of the world. But, like I said, we're going to catch up. So... If you would like to leave your stuff here, we're going to dismiss for break from out in the lab. So I'm going to hit close.